Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today on the show, we have Rebecca O'Donnell. Rebecca is an interfaith ordained minister and an ITC researcher. Now, if you don't know, ITC stands for Instrumental Transcommunication. She's also a moderator of a collective group of mediums, intuitives, and ITC researchers. Rebecca is dedicated to the development, implementation, and analysis of experiments designed to increase our knowledge about how we can effectively communicate with the spirit world. So this is going to be an exciting show. So with enthusiasm, I say, Rebecca O'Donnell, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much for having me, Sandra. Hey, it's Such- my pleasure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny. Right before we uh, pressed the record button, um, you had asked me how I found you. And it's really interesting. You know, we, we met on Facebook, but uh, every so often I feel kind of guided to certain people. And you were one that I like, I don't even remember striking up conversation. And um, but so I, I feel like sometimes these things are divinely guided. Like I need to talk to this girl, you know, so I totally agree. Somebody's totally agree. making me press the friend request. So all that being said, so you're wel- welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how about a little bit about you? You're um, got a nice big smile on the picture I'm looking at of you right now. And are you somebody that's always been interested in this life after death? Stuff. I have actually. Yeah, I've always always been interested in it. I think since a small child, um, I always would go to the library and pull out books on hauntings and oh. um, anything that I could get my hand on. You know, in elementary, middle school type topics. But <laughs> so it started definitely young. But I also had uh, a strange childhood that tied into it all too. So. On one level, I was very interested in the subject, but on another level, I was actually experiencing it as a child, uh, experiencing the paranormal. What do you mean? I'm sorry? What do you mean? (laughs) What do I mean? Okay, well, when I was, um, I would say about four or five, uh, my mother was a a young teen mom, and uh, she, my father as well, I I think she was 17 uh, when she had me, and my father was 15 years old, and he... (laughs) <laughs> he was a musician. He was a, a God gifted guitarist. And I think he didn't really have family um, as a priority to him at that age. And unfortunately, with the rock star life came a lot of drug abuse um, and, and physical abuse, mental abuse. And so my mother, uh, having my brother, who's a year younger and I decided to leave him, uh, at around four to five years old. Mm-hmm. And we, we went to homeless shelters for a while. Um, you know, living the homeless life wasn't easy because you'd had to be out of the shelters in the day. And at night you were able to sleep there, but through the day we would just walk and walk and, and find, um, food pantries to go to try to get a lunch, a bagged lunch. Wow. Um, so it, it, it came to the point where my mother knew I ha- I have to go to school. I have to go to business school. I have to get my life in order for my children. Um, she was able to uh, get a place for us through a woman's shelter and we were accepted in. But what was odd about this was this woman's shelter was inside of an old 1800 tuberculosis children's hospital or a rheumatic fever hospital very institutional brick building very old it had the ivy coming up covering the windows um and so that was my first walking into my paranormal experiences um i didn't understand it because i was so young i didn't really grasp any concept and i think i was pretty protected too by the people around me. They didn't really want me frightened in any way, but I would notice strange things that would take place in the hospital. Um, Nothing had changed. They hadn't uh, redecorated it or remodeled it at all. So all the old hospital rooms were just the same, just had beds added like a dorm room type style. You had your hard cold floors and your windows without drapery, your shared bathrooms at the end of the hallway. Um, And so it had a really cold presence. Um, But you would hear things like baby mobiles 
you know, going off in the middle of the night, or you'd hear children laughing, or empty rooms uh, that were not in use for anything in particular, you'd hear a lot of talking and chatter coming out of them. Um, I would see toys being rolled down the hallway. Um, And it was it was scary. Still, as a child, I didn't understand it. Uh, But it was, it wasn't horrifying. (laughs) Not yet, anyway. Um, So that was kind of my introduction into the supernatural. Yeah. Um, We ended up moving a few times after that. And again, I ended up, uh, we ended up in a, as a a single parent with my brother and I, we ended up in a flat of an old house in an old Italian city. Um, And it, and that was extremely haunted and it didn't come on right away when we moved into that home. Um, we, it seemed like a normal life when we got in there. I was starting school. I think I was going into middle school at that point. And, um, but then things started picking up. I would say within a year that we had been there, we would have our lights go on and off, radios turn on and off, TVs turn on and off. You would hear shuffling of papers uh, in our dining room. Um, just a lot of little, it started with odd things that would happen that were frightening. But we tried to, at the, this is in the 80s, so it wasn't a huge, um, you know, people weren't as educated as they are now. And there weren't many places to turn to to ask questions or get guidance in regards to being haunted. So um, we, we lived with it the best we could. Um, but, the, but it got to the point where it became frightening. Um, you would get touched. Your hair would get pulled. And then I started hearing voices, and I think that's where really I became fear-filled. Um, I would hear my name constantly being called, and the strange thing is it would mimic the voices of the people, like my grandmother or my mother. So I always thought it was them calling me. I'd come out and say, what? And we didn't say anything. So I started feeling a little crazy at sure, that time. of course. Yeah. Um And also I was a preteen going into my teen years. And so you add, you couple that with curiosity and the occult um, friends that would, you know, pull out their Ouija boards and say, let's, let's play with this. And what I didn't know was by doing that, we really just opened a door in that place. Um, So now we had things happening. I mean, it seemed like it happened all the time. I can tell you right now, I didn't want to skip school because I didn't want to stay home. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Um, So it it got to an apex to a point where things were getting so bad. I mean, I was having uh, my mother was sitting at the the table in our dining room and she had seen me walk in through the door and I had been out with a friend uh, at a church gathering and she had seen me walk through the door and she says, oh, hi, Rebecca. And I. I I said, hi, mom, looking forward and walked right straight past her into my bedroom. About five minutes later, I actually walked through the door and she did a double take. And she said, did you just come in? And I said, yeah, I just got home. And she goes, well, you just, I just saw you walk. Walk by, yeah. Right, right. So it was getting very, it was weird. Yes, it was getting really strange. Um, Now, uh, on another note to that was playing with that Ouija board not only affected me and my home, but it affected my friends' homes. It actually f- would follow whatever that was that we brought through, which I'm I'm assuming was something dark, um, followed them. And so I actually attended my first exorcism of a home and <laughs> by a Catholic priest. And, you know, talk about being scared. I was I, I had to renounce it all at that point. I, I didn't want to deal with the paranormal. I didn't want to deal with the occult. Um, the experiences that I had were so scary. It seemed like not many people knew um, how to help at that point either. So you kind of felt very repressed. Um, we would call cyclical research centers uh, that we could find at the time and ask for help. And the most they could help us with was, you know, burn some incense, uh, some sandalwood, or place some salt around your bed. Tell the entity to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, We weren't Catholic, so we weren't able to get an exorcism or a a priest to our house to help us in any way either. 
Um, so it was, it was something else. Oh, I, yeah. I, yeah. And in the eighties, you know, I, I, this stuff wasn't even talked about. So it, not at it, all. Uh, it had to be something bad. Even me growing up, you know, we were warned about the Ouija boards, you know? Oh yeah. Like, oh yeah. And, and from a spirit's point of view, if I, even if I was a happy spirit, be like, hey, these people want to communicate. Come on, gang, let's, exactly. let's do it from the other side. Okay. okay. So then. So then. Um, yeah. So then this, that there was, I renounced everything. I shut it down. I said, I don't want to hear these voices anymore. I don't want to see anything. Mom, we have to move. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we ended up having to, believe it or not, leave encyclopedias and pretend that we were coming back to that house just so that whatever was there wouldn't follow us. And it was like we started a new chapter. We were able to kind of break free of that. Mm -hmm. But there were still odd paranormal and strange things that happened throughout, I would say, all the way up into my mid-20s. I tried not to pay attention to them. Um, I tried to just live my happy, free-spirited teenage life and, you know, go out for coffee with my friends and travel. Um, But I, I could never really shake it. And I remember a friend saying to me, I think you're haunted back. I think it's you. <laughs> oh, how nice. Thank <laughs> right? you very much. So, so, I mean, that was like, you know, whoa. Um, I definitely didn't want to partake in any kind of anything that had to do with spiritualism or, yeah. or, or spirit communications or right. anything like that. So as time went on and I, I got into my mid-20s and everything, and my life kind of balanced out, everything was good. I had some friends, you know, and this is at the time now we're coming up into the 90s and the early 2000s um, where the ghost hunting shows were big. Yeah. And so my friends were like, let's go to Gettysburg. Let's go ghost hunting, you know. And I still had an interest in it. I still like to read about it. But I I wasn't so much hands on. I was more of a stand back, you know, yeah. and, and let, let everyone else do it. I'll just kind of watch. (laughs) But I did start partaking a little bit. I started, you know, going and trying to do investigations with recorders. Mm -hmm. And we did, we knew nothing really. I mean, I didn't research it deep enough to really know what I was doing. But um, I I did it for the fun of it. I did it with my friends. I felt a little safer for some reason. And, and so that that's, that's pretty much how it went until (laughs) uh, it was about 2008. And I had a a terrible accident where I had fallen off a flight of stairs and I thought I, at the time I had broken my ankle, but what ended up happening was I ended up uh, having a neurological uh, disease happen because of the shock and the trauma from the fall. It was something that um, they would relate to as uh, back in the civil war when the the men would get their legs shot off from the trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, It was, they called it RSD or reflex sympathetic dystrophy And it basically, your brain misfires, and it tells you that you're in constant pain. And I was in, I mean, I wasn't healing. I I had a really good job at that time. I was really just doing great. Um, But I was unable to even put a sock on my foot. I I couldn't, I couldn't walk. (laughs) I just, I was stuck. I wasn't healing. And I had gone to so many doctors and specialists and you know at first it was complete denial like you know you need to just go to physical therapy and get back on your feet but they didn't understand that I couldn't even put my foot on the floor to use the the potty right (laughs) you know it was like wow yeah Yeah. I'm sitting in a camping chair in my shower trying to you know trying to take a shower it's like I couldn't even stand and and so I finally got the diagnosis um that I did in fact have CRPS, which complex regional pain syndrome is the new new uh, slang for it. Um, and that I may never walk again. So I was going to be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of my life. It went from this really active person, this happy people person that loved to travel as, and, and, and have all these great experiences to just being stuck with this mm-hmm. pain. And so within that, I ended up really inward inwardly reflecting on my life and because I think when you have a pain disease um you know it feels like you just feel doomed you just feel like why bother going on anymore you know yeah and yeah honestly a lot of people and I understand it I didn't at the time before this but they become suicidal sure 
And so I became suicidal. Why bother? Why bother living? I can't walk. I can't ride a bike. I can't. I can't even work. I can't concentrate. Mm-hmm. So I shifted my focus. I had a, a, a lot of good people around me um, to help me get through this. And I, I started reading. I started learning about meditations. Um, I started learning about binarial beats. And um, I decided that if I couldn't do what I wanted physically, then I'm going to have to do it mentally. Mentally, and I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah. And so that's when the shift came in. Now, I think really... I have to I have to credit you and your book because you came into play with this because I had just started on my research journey. I mean, really researching things. And I was always interested in, uh, as we know, spiritual communication and spirits and hauntings and things like that. But I really wanted to know more. I needed more meat and potatoes. And I wasn't mm-hmm. sure where to start. Um, and I ended up, I remember I had seen a, a documentary and it was the Skoll Experiments. And there was a man named Marcello Bacci or Marcello Bacci. Mm-hmm. And he, he was out of Italy and he was doing uh, radio communication uh, with the dead. And I knew innately that I could do that. I don't know how. It was just deep inside of me. I knew and I, I proclaimed I can do that. And... And so from there, it was like, well, how do I do this? <laughs> I don't right. have an old, I don't have an old tube radio, and and I'm kind of stuck. I'm disabled now. So what do I do? So I got a hold of your book, and all the wonderful information in your book steered me. It steered me to Tom and Lisa Butler's website. It steered me to opening up and reading um, Sarah Estep, uh, her books, and realizing that. I, this was going to be a self-education time. And, you know, you have such a great spirit and you're <laughs> such Thank a you. fun, you're such a fun, positive, loving person and, and down to earth. And I just, you get that really comes out in your writing. And so that was like a little bit of a saving grace for me. Oh, thank you so much for that. <laughs> oh, not a problem. I mean, and, and, you know, the other thing that was happening simultaneously was right the year before the accident and up to five years after the accident, I had lost a lot of friends and a lot of family members. And so not only was I going through my own process of grieving, but uh, for my body breaking down and things, but I was going through the overall grieving of the loss of loved ones right. and feeling like, is this it? You know, is, are they gone? I, I wasn't having dreams of them. I, you know, everyone's like, oh, have you had a dream of them yet? Have they come in and said hi? And it wasn't happening. I was so stuck in that grief that I couldn't, I couldn't be open to any signs. Um, but, through your book and the connections pushing me out into researching more, I ended up uh, inevitably getting there, you know, and, and so that leads us up to now. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. So today, um, I would say, you know, it started uh, when I really started focusing. I, I did everything I could as far as, you know, reading, um, meditating, um, going to classes, psychic circles, lectures that I could get to in my wheelchair, um, a lot of books. <laughs> sure. and, but the biggest hurdle of it all wasn't so much as the knowledge as putting it into practice. And because I had been so scarred from the paranormal activities of my childhood, I really was fear-filled. But I remember this one part in your book where you sat quiet and you had your recorder and I know you were nervous too, and you had said you were a little scared, but you yes. you were gonna do it. You were gonna try it and 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 you did it, and sure enough, there was that those voices that came through. Right. And I thought, if she can do this, I can do this. I can do this. And so I just I did it. I jumped in. Now I have to say, did I didn't get anything at first. <laughs> I had a, a whole recording of just nothing. Right. And I thought, well, you know, she says you gotta try, you gotta you know, you keep gotta, going. Yeah, keep trying. And, 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 and through the, what else, you know, the other information I had read, it was like, you know, you have to set it up at a certain time and, and you really have to dedicate and be committed and form a relationship in order to really break through and communicate. Yes. And so from there it turned. So I started with uh, running the water uh, through the tap and placing the recorder. And, and then I evolved it to 
taking showers at a certain time every day and running that recorder while I was in the shower. We, let's just stop to, to make this clear. What we're talking about is electronic voice phenomena, right? That is correct. Recording the sounds of something else other than voices, whether it be the sound of a shower or running water from the faucet, recording it is what she's talking about. And then after you play it back and you listen. Exactly. So, okay. so I'll let you continue. Thank you. But just, Sorry, I got so excited. Well, it's okay. It's okay. I ended up having Tom Butler on the show uh, several episodes ago, and we jumped right into talking about EVP. And I thought, you know, I've never talked to this before, about this before. You know, it's um, not the common conversation to talk about electronic voice phenomena and, you know, and, um, you know, trans communication and things like that. So just want to make sure everybody's on board with where we're talking. Okay, back to you. Exactly. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I started with the water and the shower. And when I replayed, I noticed that the voices needed, the spirit voices needed something almost to propel them. So I wasn't getting very good results with nothing, just sitting quietly in a room. But something about the noise, they were, I was able to hear them come through. They came through fast and they came through sounding almost like chipmunks. <laughs> and I, I knew I had heard something and, and when I reviewed it, mm -hmm. um, but then there it was clear as, clear as could be. I heard grandpa Oh. and I, you know, both sets of my grandparents are on the other side. And so I wasn't sure what grandfather it was, but I definitely know I heard grandpa. Mm -hmm. And then I heard my old best friend that had just died a few years previously. And I heard Amy and I thought, Oh my gosh, I've connected. I'm hearing them. Mm -hmm. So I decided, okay, I'm really going to continue this. I'm going to keep doing this. And I, I continued doing the showers. Now, what I started noticing was, yes, when you did this at a certain time every day, it was like they would show up for it. It was like a meeting. Yes, we'll be there. But I also realized that I was getting other voices that were coming through that I didn't know who they were. And they were being a little lewd. Um, they would say things about me. I mean, here I am naked in the shower running a recorder <laughs> on my sink. And they're saying like, you know, kind of dirty things. And I'm going, oh, that's not good. That's not good. Oh, my. What did you yeah. tap into? Okay, I've never had any experience other than humor and loving messages. So go ahead. Right. You're so some... I, I was so I was freaked out. I remember going to speak to a medium, a psychic medium yeah. about this. And I said, you know, can, can these spirits see you? Now she assured me they just see energy. You look like an aura to them. They see, they see your soul. Yeah, I've heard that. Too. Right. And, and, you know, I thought, oh, great. That's good. Okay. But when I got home and did my shower sessions, I can tell you right now, they see a little more than that. Right, right, right. <laughs> so right there, I had proved this person wrong. And I knew, oh, wow, maybe I shouldn't be doing this in the shower anymore. Maybe I should I should kind of take this on an, another uh, another path, another direction. So I started experimenting. I, I would sit in my office and, and run a fan or uh, I would sometimes do it in a vehicle on a long trip of the road noise. Um, I would just turn my recorder on and start talking and see if there was anyone in the car with me. And I was getting responses. And I think. What I started, uh, I actually ended up getting my hands on um, what's called a PSB7 spirit box. And it's essentially all it is, is a, it's a little kind of Radio Shack uh, radio that has the tuner taken out so that you can press, turn it on and it scans through the stations in really fast clips. Okay. And what I noticed was I was getting excellent communication through that. I mean, of course, it wasn't live time I was hearing it. It was on upon review I was getting these excellent right. things. But what they were telling me was pray, pray. And I hadn't been protecting myself. I really was just diving in blindly to things, and I wasn't really doing the research. And I really, you know, take I, I decided – geez, Beck, you've read all these books and you're not even following what they're telling you to, to, to do. And you really need to sit down and say a prayer of protection and focus yourself on what you, you know, who do you want to talk to? And do you want these beings coming into your room, looking at you and saying negative things to you? No, I don't. And I, I think it was then that I decided, okay, I am going to do non-local communication. I, I don't want to ghost hunt. I don't want the physical feeling of things around me. I didn't want to invite, 
you know, open my door up to the street and just invite random spirits in. Yes. I, I needed to connect to beings that were full of knowledge that were going to give me uh, really just give me the meat and potatoes that I was looking for. Not, not just, you know, very light conversations or um, <laughs> just really lower level energy stuff that was coming through. So that really, ref- I refocused and through the help of a spirit team that I ended up learning about <laughs> that I had, um, I started learning all these things and, and pushing forward. I started learning that I had a group of spirits that were working with me and that I had been destined to do this my whole life. And that that accident that happened to me was just a redirect. It was saying, they were saying, you know, Beck, you're, you're doing great, but you weren't exactly going where you were supposed to go. And now you're here and we're going to help you. And, and so through prayers and through speaking and learning who was working with me, uh, family members, friends, and people I didn't know of that I, I think of as spirit friends. I may not know them, but they're my spirit friends. Did you hear them? That's how you knew them? Or did they come to you in meditation saying, we're helping I heard, with this? I actually heard them, uh, physically heard them through the recordings. And they were very clear. I mean, it was shocking. It was it was shocking. I thought, wow, do other people get this kind of communication? Is it just me? And, you know, I, I feel like when I watched videos on YouTube of other people doing this, it didn't seem like the same kind of stuff I was getting. Um, it, even though it was quick clips, you know, like um, very short bursts, not long sentences, but no, like short bursts, short. Yep. I was able to piece it together and get rid of the garbage in between, the, um, the, the commercials that might pop in. But in between when you'd hear your name, like Becky, pray, or... Uh, you know, at one point, they even made up a password to get into the session so that I because I kept telling the spirits, I don't want any negative lower level entities coming in. I don't want to deal with that. That something that scared me. And so I need protection. And so they would say, we are your bouncers. You know, you'd hear words like bouncers or protection or prayer. And I learned that I needed to be direct and ask them what uh, tell them what I wanted. And it, it changed the game for me completely. Um, and then it just started progressing from there. I moved on to, I decided I'm going to buckle down. I'm going to really get into this because I think my mission, my goals were to, to give people, to let people know that you don't die as we know, we don't die. And, and I wanted them to feel the love and the comfort and I wanted them to feel the forgiveness or resolution in their lives like I did. And it took me a long time to get there, but I wanted to share that with other people. And so that was my goal, love, comfort, forgiveness, and resolution. And if I could bring that to one person, a skeptic, anyone that, that or anyone just in severe grief, then that's what I was going to do. And that mm-hmm. was my mission. So naturally, I progressed. I started keeping notes. I started keeping journals. I started experimenting uh, with different apps and programs and computer software and Babel, um, And I started, uh, you know, actually, at the same time, I was I was implementing different methods, bringing in crystals to the session. Did did, did certain crystals amplify the session and make it better? Um, Did it make it worse? I I experimented with Reiki. I uh, had uh, my mother's a Reiki practitioner. I had her come in and sit and actually put the Reiki out to the spirits. And let me tell you. They would tell me that hundreds of them would be lined up for the Reiki, and they would yell, Reiki, Reiki. Um, they also asked for prayer, which was interesting to me. And I think that was perplexing, because we think of, you know, heaven. We're, we kind of are programmed that there's heaven, and, and everybody becomes this all-knowing being, and they're all healed and happy. But I learned through my studies that this wasn't the case, that there were there were spirits that needed prayer. There were spirits that needed healing and, and things from us, from the living. Um, I, I focused on weather conditions and full moon cycles and retrogrades and trigger objects and mirrors and lighting. Um, I found that illness and depression changed the dynamic of my sessions. Mm-hmm. So when I, I, I uh, found that incense and essential oils and meditations and intentions and symbols, they all, they all played into this. And, and so that's, that's where I, I came, I came to really buckle down and say, there's got to be more. I'm going to go for this. My, my goal now is to have 
a, almost like a phone call type of communication. Oh, they're, when, they're working on it. Um, right. Yeah. And, and what's amazing was, I kid you not, my phone started ringing. My cell phone. I got calls from a number 0000000000. 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 000. And I was freaked out. What is this? This is a number calling coming across my cell phone with no, you know, no number. Do I answer this? And I would let it go to voicemail. And there on the voicemail would be EVPs coming through. I would take, I, I would hear things like, it sounded almost like a TV playing in the background. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe someone pocket dialed me, but that's such a strange number, zero, 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 zero. So I ended up putting it into my computer and, and amplifying it and listening to it. And there it is. They're, they're saying, hey, Becky, they're talking right to me. They were calling me on the phone. I don't know how it was happening, but it happened several times throughout throughout the past few years. Very wow. random. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you familiar with the gang with the Afterlife Research and Education Institute? I am. Yes. I figured you were. Because yes. there's a whole bunch going on with the soul phone and... Um, there's Sonia Rinaldi. Is she in Brazil? Yes. Who works with? Uh, it's like a telephone, right? And parent, a child, deceased children come through and give messages to their parents. Right. Um, yeah. This is a not often talked about life after death thing. Uh, I, I haven't found, but um, there are those of us who know of it, and I think for me doing my recordings which I've got quite a few of them was just part of the journey so I, I mean there's a bigger picture of, of everything else I wanted to learn and share but I, I just have the sneaky suspicion that um, there's a team of invisible folks on the other side that are also working probably several mm -hmm. teams as to this communication and all of a sudden there's this uh, young red-haired girl going I'm into this and so the more you practice the more you're experimenting you know they're your partners on the other side making these things happen that's exactly exactly it's how pretty it is. cool it's pretty yes, cool it do, is. You, do you have because I I always have to put on my skeptical mind because we all have one because and so many people with me said yeah let me hear these recordings you know do uh, do you have sample recordings that people can hear I do, Anywhere? and I I actually have a YouTube channel. You do? Uh, okay. I do. And you can just type in YouTube Rebecca O'Donnell and my name, and you should see all my um, ITC work, all my recordings. Oh, I, good for I, you. Yeah, I've actually done sessions uh, with – I actually progressed to the point where I was doing sessions for uh, friends, family, people that would uh, hear about me and contact me and ask, you know, I, I lost my boyfriend to a suicide, and I really need to know he's okay. Would well, you be willing? Tell us Sorry. a little bit about that, if you would, because, um, yeah, what happened with that? Because I, I would assume that that would bring some wonderful feelings of faith if they heard the voice of a loved one. Oh, yeah. Is that what was uh, coming through? That was what was happening. I'd, I had no clue I could even do that. I, I knew that I had a connection to my spirit team. And I knew that I had friends and family coming through speaking to me. I was 100% sure I could communicate for me. Right. But was I able to c communicate for another person? That was that was the, the grand experiment for me. So what I started doing was doing phone calls where I would put the person on a speakerphone. And I would run software silently through my laptop and my, my personal computer on my desk. Mm -hmm. um, and I would put a recorder down on my desk while the person was on speakerphone and I would have them ask a series of t 10 questions and I didn't want to push. I know that spirit loses energy um, through time. So I didn't want to go over 20 minutes. So I would break up, you know, every two minutes, ask one question, we'd get 10 questions out and let's just see what happens. I, I didn't guarantee anything. I just thought, let's just go for it and try it. Yeah. And to my surprise, they were able to come through and my spirit team helped bring them through it wasn't I have to say this a lot of people think it's just going to be you're going to hear that person's voice and know definitively that's my son my daughter my boyfriend 
it doesn't work that way. Um, the programs and apps I use that it does occasionally. Okay, occasionally you'll get a voice that sounds resemblant of the person that has died, but for the most part, it sounds as if your spirit guides, your a spirit team may talk for them. Uh, so you may hear a female speaking for a male or a male speaking for a female, but it was the content that was important. So I, I needed to reassure people of that, like it, it may not sound like your son or your boyfriend, but you, what we're looking for is, is the content match? Does this sound like this is that person to you? Yeah. What kind is of questions it, and answers? Can you give us a couple examples? Um, sure. Let's see. I had one girl want, well, I think the most asked question is, are they okay? Are you okay on the other side? Uh, because they want to know that their family member has has made it. They're not stuck on earth. They're not a ghost haunting. They're not right. in any form of hell. So <laughs> they want to make sure they're okay. So that's the number one question is, are you okay? Um, oh, geez, there's so many of them. Uh, they want to know details about things that maybe they didn't get answers to on earth. So if the person uh, passed in a car accident, they it's they tend to ask questions as far as you know um were you hit uh, or were you hit by a car were you walking home from a certain place that night because they didn't get all that detail they they had this traumatic thing happen and now they're just stuck in their grief and they have all these questions and no answers um so the, the questions vary i think by person and and depending on the level of grief are they more than yes no answers yes they are can you tell me where your baseball hat is? Um, Which an answer know, would come through to that? An, an answer would come through, like maybe in the trunk or uh, in the basement, mom. And it, it, it's interesting because it's a, a string of words that are separated by different voices that form the sentence. So it's not just one person saying, yes, you go to the basement, mom, and you're going to find my baseball hat. But it would be more broken up, like in, and then another person would say the basement. And then another person would say, mom. So it's it's all them working collectively together to get that answer out to you. Mm, I had somebody once uh, say that if you could imagine going 10 feet underwater and you're trying to get a loud, clear communication to someone who's outside of the pool. You know, I mean, you're yelling, you're trying to be clear, uh, but it doesn't always come that way. You know, sometimes it does. and uh, And from what I've gathered myself is our loved ones and the science team over there with them, they're, they're rearranging the sounds that are captured on your recorder or your computer, whatever, and they're rearranging them into language. That's exactly it, yes. Yeah, so it's going to sound choppy. I and mean, a lot of the ones I've gotten sounded kind of mechanical. Some did sound like ladies, some did, did sound like men. Um, robotic. Robotic, robotic. Yeah. yes. Yeah. They've come, uh, you know, it's come so far. We have so many great people working under, you know, like you said, it's not a well-known thing. But there are a lot of researchers and a lot of app makers, and I would say they're scientists in a way, that are, are working really hard to produce a better communication. So we've come a long way from recording tap water to uh, even, a, a you know, a little spirit box that scans radio stations to the point now where we're, we're able to use software that can give you lifetime responses if you're if you're really trained to hear it. You can hear it live, and you're able to respond immediately back to them, oh, which is the amazing. closest thing it's I've ever seen it go to. I've never seen it up until this point get as good at it as it is. Um, there is a um, a man named Martin out of Canada who creates uh, his website's ExtremeSenses.com, and he has a lot of free software that people who may want to try to communicate with their loved ones can download the software for free and give it a try. I, I say don't expect any miracles, obviously, when you try this at first. But there's something with his software in particular that I find my communication is tenfold of what it was. And I'm able to get lifetime responses back and forth. Um, and also, the most beautiful thing lately, I've noticed, is they've incorporated in the, into these software programs, the ability to play your own music um, through it while you're conducting these sessions. And it wasn't until very recently that I found 
that music is such a wonderful way to lift that vibration. And you really find that the communication just enhances amazingly to the point where it almost feels like you are on a phone call. They're hearing the music. They comment on the music. They tell you who's singing. They scream out people that they want to hear. Um, you know, I've had them scream out Elvis and Beatles and the journey, you know, play us that. And so I started experimenting with that and found this is bringing it to a whole nother level. Wow. Rebecca, can you do me a favor? Yeah. Um, well, you and I are recording this. So you who's listening right now, this will already be done by the time you do this. But if you would be so kind and um, email me some of these links that we can... Oh. And what I'll do is anyone who goes to we don't die radio dot com, click on episode one three eight with Rebecca O'Donnell, will have the links to the software and some of these things. Because I know when I first heard about this, you know, I it's like oh, how do I try that? You know? Yeah. Um so if you'd be willing we Oh, can... I'd be more than happy to. Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, because I also will include the Afterlife Research and Education Institute. They're trying, they're working on something called a soul phone right now. Um, yeah, and, and really with the idea is that there's teams of people on the other side that are working just as hard as trying to get this communication going. It's true. So and it's I think it's pretty cool. That's really the message, too, is that you really have to be open, but you have to understand we we go on. And we are constantly around each other. I mean, we, the people that we love when we pass over, we are around them. We, we support them. We send loving, compassionate thoughts. And, and, you know, a lot of people are just so stuck in their grief that they don't see it, but it's there. And you just have to open yourself up and, and, you know, be open to the synchronicities, be open to the music that comes through. Um, even if you're not going to try uh, sitting down and doing EVPs, be open to listening to the radio and hearing a song. Yes, listening yeah. to the words of the song. Music is, so, I'm glad you brought up music because um, whether we're grieving, whether we're looking for a sign from our loved one from a medium, you know, there's so many ways that we want to communicate. And they say, they, whoever they are, is our energy has to be good. And so you have to do things to feel good. And I know people that have um, done a few things to feel better, whether they're grieving and they go out for a walk or they spend a day um, in a park with children or puppies or something. Anything to make them feel better actually shifts the vibration. And so happy music is another one. And start playing that and, you know, suddenly there's all these synchronicities or you start having uh, dreams of your loved ones or you know, whatever their favorite thing was starts happening to you. And um, so definitely something. So and, true. Yeah. And I, something else is coming to mind that I want to um, just bring up because when I first started being on interviews talking about EVPs, you know, people would say, how do you know this isn't your imagination? How do you know this is the real deal? Yeah. Um, do you have a, a time that you knew? I mean, I'm sure you knew because you've been into this, but you know, I would shock myself. Like, there's no freaking way. Unless I heard this, I would know this. Yeah, I, I, I approached it like that as well. I was like, I'm not sure. I'm gonna, but yeah, uh, I think for me was hearing the people that I loved the most and had lost coming through, saying the words they said to me when they were alive. They were trigger. Like yeah. my grand, my grandmother would always tell me to smile. She'd say, smile. It takes more muscles to frown than to smile, she'd say. And so I would hear smile come through. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew that that's grandma. She's telling me to smile. And so these little things, these little, they're, they're the way they connect. And it was becoming to the point where it was, there was no way in my mind that I could even, I, I couldn't go skeptic on this anymore. I knew 100% that we exist, we go on, uh, we want to communicate with each other, uh, they want to communicate with us. Um, you know, the, the, the most amazing thing is, uh, for me, was I was getting warnings from my grandfather about my roof of my house that I had just bought. And he kept screaming, roof, grandpa, roof, roof. And so this went on for a while. I, I dismissed it and I didn't understand what was happening. And then it became to the point where it was so repetitive. I thought, 
well, clearly I'm, I'm being dense here. I, I need to have someone look at my roof. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, now I'm not going to climb up on my own roof. So I convinced my stepfather to get up there and check my roof. And sure enough, he gets up on that roof and he says, oh my God, your roof is so damaged. It, it's going to collapse down in on your, on your, you know, you're going to lose your living room. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, here my grandfather's been screaming to me for a month, roof, roof, get your roof checked. And his face went pale. He couldn't believe it because he knew <laughs> I had told him, you know, grandpa's telling me from the other side that something's wrong with my roof and grandma's talking about my car needing brakes. And so there's there were these um, predictive things that were coming through, future events. And I just, I wasn't receiving them right away. But as they repeated and repeated, it was like, okay, maybe I need to look into these things. And and sure enough, I had to have my roof replaced. And it was right on that edge where my beautiful custom ceilings, I had just remodeled my home, were going to be gone if I didn't get this done. And so, you know, it was like a saving grace. And I knew then it was like, okay, this is it. I mean, how how much more proof do I need that, that they're able to see what's going on around us? Mm. I, I want to talk to Rebecca just a little bit about fear because when I first tried to or attempted to do a recording I scared the heck out of myself like if somebody starts talking I can't handle it um this is like the devil uh you know there's a, there's a lot of fear there and I you know everybody can believe what they want to believe I I tend to think um when we go on crossover die whatever that we retain our same personalities and uh yeah we might not get rid of all the baggage you know so we could be negative and and things like that no we're not all wise your loved ones that have passed don't have all the answers to when tall dark and handsome is going to walk into your life you know those kind of things but um could you just talk a little bit about do we need to be afraid do we need to set the intention um can people feel comfortable doing this without thinking that they're going to talk to Beelzebub, you know? Right, right. Right. I think we need to be conscious of what we're saying and the energy we're putting out, the intentions that we're putting out. So if you're open to receiving anything, you're going to get anything. If you're open to, if, if you're looking to connect directly to a family member or a friend, you have to state that intention, whether it be through a prayer or through a, a silent thought. Um, because really, you know, the best example is when you're dealing with the spirit world, and I guess a, a comparison is if, if, you, if you're having a house party <laughs> and you have your front door wide open and all the lights are on in the house and there's music and people dancing around and the people that are walking by that house are going to be curious and they're going to want to stick their head in. And there are people that are going to even go into the house because it's an open door and Hey, maybe they can get a a free beer. Thank you. So really you, you want to set a boundary. You definitely want to send a set a boundary and have an, have your intention set of what you're looking for, because the biggest question for the, well, the spirits have asked said to me are, what are your intentions? They've asked me, what are your intentions? I mean, is it to just, you know, shoot the crap with them? Or is it to actually get knowledge from the other side? Is it to connect? Is it to help heal? What is it that you're doing? So I think you need to go in with a clear mindset and you have to have boundaries set as well. Um, I can tell you that the, based on the fear thing, um, when I first started running the equipment, uh, the little spirit boxes and stuff, I was getting the name Edgar coming through. And I thought, who is this Edgar? You know, this this name was coming through all the time. Edgar, Edgar. I didn't know any family members named Edgar. Um, I was a little frightened, actually, by the voice. It was a very dark, kind of macabre, uh-huh. husky voice, you know. And and I, I noticed that wherever I ran my session, whether I did it in my office or in my cousin's basement trying to show him, you know, this is what I do. Look at this. You can hear these voices. This name was coming through. And I noticed that when I would hear that, I'd feel a little fear filled. And I didn't understand it. It was it was a definitely an empath type feeling like, oh, I I don't like this. Maybe this person, this, this is a spirit that's haunting me and it's following me around. This isn't grandma and grandpa. This is some Edgar person. And, um, 
after I learned about boundaries and intentions and setting up, you know, saying prayers of protection and, and, and saying, this is what I want, Edgar continued to come through. And the most amazing thing happened. I found out that he started calling me Virginia. <laughs> and yeah, he would close like, to Rebecca. Right. And I, <laughs> I'd say Virginia. Yeah. Like, uh, now, I was confused at first. Is this Virginia coming through or Edgar coming? What's happening? Right. Um, but he would say, my wife, my wife. So I started looking things up online. Edgar. Okay. Names of Edgar, Edgar Casey, Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I'm going to ask Edgar, what is your last name? And sure enough, it was Edgar Allan Poe coming through. Edgar Allan Poe has been coming through to me for six years, and he claims that I am his wife, Virginia, from a past life, and it was mind-blowing. I mean, I know it sounds crazy pants. I know it does, <laughs> but it was mind-blowing to me. Like, why is this person, this Edgar calling me Virginia, and he would start stating his poetry, and he would call me his wife, and he would call me these little nicknames like his julep. And so I decided I'm going to buckle down and research this. I'm, yeah. I'm going to look, you know, and I did. I got right onto Google and I started Googling all. I didn't know very much about him, but. What was his wife's I, name? Virginia Allen Poe. Oh, my gosh. Right. Or Virginia Clem. And, you know, she was a 13-year-old, his cousin, his, his actual cousin. Oh, he married. Yeah. And, I, and it was, yeah, right. It was super creepy. I'm like, this is super creepy. Okay. But what the oddest thing was was that I found a letter, the only letter that she had penned uh, in her life, because she died super young of, um, oh, I think it was consumption. And I kid you not, that was my handwriting. I, I sat and I wrote what I had seen. And my, my handwriting was like 99% exact to her wow. handwriting. So that was when I thought, oh, my god, Maybe gosh. you are her. Maybe you yeah. came back from being yeah. her. Yes. And so I established this relationship with Edgar and asked him, why are you around me? What's going on? I mean, I knew I read all the stories. I knew that that was one of his loves of his life. Um, but he had told me from the beginning, I am here to help you write your book. And I thought, OK, I'm not a writer. I, I definitely am not into poetry. <laughs> So what is it exactly that I'm I'm writing and why exactly are you here? And it and it turned out that, you know, after session after session, after thousands upon thousands of Edgars and Virginias, that what I learned was that he was there in spirit to help me write the book about the ITC research that I'm doing. And I learned that if I kind of quiet myself, it's almost like he's in the room standing behind me. Um, helping me sit down and, and blow through a chapter. And it's amazing. It just started coming through me. And I thought, this is just amazing. This is like you expect to talk to family members within this lifetime that have passed or friends, but you don't expect past life uh, spirits to be involved. You don't expect, you know, ancestors to come in. And they do. They're, they're all connected in your soul family. So they're there to help. They're there to support and propel you through your, you know, t to be there. Wow. So this is pretty cool. <laughs> I, I know this conversation isn't for everybody. I know it's not. Um, but for those that are interested, I mean, there's no better way to convince yourself <laughs> than to jump right in, roll up your sleeves. And it does take practice. I mean, getting an EVP recording, um, you know, Rebecca, I had done a lot of recordings that I thought nothing was on. And then once I gained my ear to really being able to listen in, all of a sudden I found there were tons of stuff on those first recordings. It's like if you've never been to France and you've never heard the French language and all of a sudden tons of people around you are speaking French. It just sounds like uh, gibberish, you know, but then all of a sudden you learn thank you or bonjour or hello or whatever all of a sudden if you go to that country and you hear somebody say that like you recognize that that word so i think evps are so similar because you know your ears want to want to listen to the sound of the running water or whatever the background noise is and it really takes something to be able to differentiate and and start hearing the words but i tell you once you do it's like learning a new language and your ears pick right up on it and uh <laughs> 
it's, it's pretty fun. And and but, I I've never had any you know negative stuff, but I I always have had the intention now that I look at it that it's positive that their messages of love are funny you know there's definitely some humor that's come through oh exactly right on that's exactly exactly you 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 nailed it yeah I don't want to swear but um how can I say oh I can say a-hole right that's yeah pretty much it (laughs) um my brother years ago I, I told him I was playing around with this and uh we did a recording and it kept being repeated this guy's name i don't remember the guy's name but um it's ken's an a-hole ken's an a-hole ken's an a-hole right yeah and so like i'm listening to it i'm like i don't i don't know what this is and so you know my brother you know could see the tears well up in his eyes he was in the um air national guard with this guy who had just passed away and they had a friend named ken and anytime somebody said ken everybody would yell out ken's an (laughs) a-hole right so that came through on the the message now i would have never known that i'm like oh that sure sounds like somebody's swearing you know right but like that's all my brother needed to know that his friend is very much alive yeah so whatever and this now I'm speaking to our listener. You know, if some of these things interest you, follow them. You know, I've had listeners that really had a hard time believing mediumship is real. And then they've taken a course in mediumship and have been accurately been, been able to tell people who their deceased loved ones are. So um, whatever it takes for you, you know, sometimes conversations are enough to have you know that your loved ones is still around. But if this if this fascinates you, yeah, go to wedontdieradio.com episode 138 with Rebecca O'Donnell and we have links to some fun stuff you can download and play with and, and find out who else is doing some of these uh, recordings and then also to Rebecca's YouTube page and I even have some recordings you can listen to. Pretty cool stuff. Um, anything, because our time's just about up, anything I should have asked you that I didn't or that you want to share as closing words, Rebecca? Um, don't live in fear. Know that there is an afterlife, that life goes on. Um, don't be afraid to open yourself up to it, basically expect the unexpected. And yeah, I think that's all. That's perfect. <laughs> and you can have fun with this. You can. You can. Really can. Um, and it's healing. It's very yeah, healing. It is very healing. Um, let me ask you about your health. It's still in a wheelchair, still with terrible foot pain? Nope. The miracle happened. I was able to work through with my, I had an angel therapist, a uh, physical therapist to help me to get walking with a cane. And through the course of medications and thera- physical therapy, I'm able to get around now. So uh, life, life has gotten better and changed Uh, for the better wow that is miraculous well thank you so much thank you for having me this was such a great and i'm assuming uh, that you welcome people to become your facebook friend and um, get in touch with you and join oh tell us about this the collective uh group that you oh definitely because a lot of us are on facebook and can go find this right now there are a ton of groups on Facebook. A lot of them, they're, they're all, a lot of them are wonderful. But um, I run a, um, a specific group called Spirit. It's called a Spirit, a Collective for Mediums, Intuitives, and ITC research- Researchers. And basically, I was just trying to bridge the gap. So I welcome mediums and intuitives and empaths and healers and crystal, people that love crystals, anything that, you know, that interests you. Um, you're welcome to come in. ITC research, researchers, photographers, uh, EVP audio specialists, they, they put their work into that community. So you're able to listen to examples and see photographs of spirit. Um, so feel free to, to sign up and, and join the community. And if you have questions, feel free to email me. I'd love to answer any questions you have. Um, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I've got a link to your email address and that Facebook group and everything else we've talked about on we don't die radio.com episode 138 rebecca o'donnell so thanks my friend thank you and and a super big thanks for um just acknowledging my book uh, you know there's tons of copies that are sold out in the world and some people have written that the difference that it's made in their life from not committing suicide to mending relationships and and healing you know, so many things um yes. but to hear right on the court that it got you 
into your journey and now how much you're giving back. Like I had no idea. So thank you for oh, that. Yeah. And to get your book written because the same phenomena is going to happen. Um, you might give birth to the next wave of scientists that are, are out to cross, um, connect, you know, the bridge between two worlds. So I support you in getting that done. Thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome so much. Okay. So in closing, my friends, uh, th- thank you for listening. I, I, do believe you've enjoyed the show because I sure have. And my name is Sandra Champlain. I, of course, have been your host on yet another episode of We Don't Die Radio. Keep the emails coming. You know, a good guest that I need to interview, set me up with them so um, we can hear some of these great stories. Delve right in yourself. You find something interesting. Yeah, do some more research on it. Play with it. Um, this is fun. And I tell you, your loved ones are trying to get through to you as much as you're trying to get through to them. So in closing, I want to say thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>